woman who was considering joining the church made an appointment to see me. When she came into my office, she was carrying about 40 pages of a document, which she then threw down in disgust on the coffee table. I looked to see what it was, <laughs> only to discover the newly published treatise from our denomination about how to understand the sacrament of Holy Communion. What the bleep is this, she asked. Is it the body of Christ or isn't it? <laughs> it is, I answered. She said, good, and joined the church. <laughs> and to be clear, what I told her is not the formal position of the United Methodist Church. But in my view, when it takes 40 pages to explain your position, on how bread and wine both are and are not the body of Christ, something has gone deeply wrong. These are not supposed to be Schrodinger's elements. However, I believe the problem existed long before that document, long before there was a Methodist church, long before even the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century when that same question about how to intellectually understand how bread and wine are not really the body of Christ splintered the Protestant movement right from the get-go. I think the moment it went wrong was when Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me, quietly morphed from do this into think this. And to see how we got there, we need to go back to Paul's first letter to the church he founded in the Greek city of Corinth. Kathy read earlier from the 11th chapter, which shows us Paul in the middle of trying to fix a major problem in that particular church, a conflict over the shared meal that was the hallmark of every gathering of every church in its first days. The little bit of bread and wine, or in our case, juice, that we will share later in the service as the Sacrament of Holy Communion is just a small reminder of the large, shared, full meal that defined the hospitality and countercultural welcome of Christian fellowship in its earliest days. A full meal was central to every gathering because that's how the earliest followers of Jesus interpreted his words at the Last Supper when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. The this in do this was believed to mean eat, have dinner, enjoy communion in community with each other. Eat and drink together without regard for economic or social status and share with each other the love and abundant hospitality of God just as Jesus did with his disciples that night and on countless other occasions. That's what church was at first. Gather at someone's house to share both a meal and the joys and challenges of trying to follow Jesus day to day. But once the persecution of Christians by Rome got serious, it became unsafe for Christians to gather for a regular meal. So they met in secret, most famously down among the dead in the catacombs under Rome, taking with them just a bit of bread and wine to share, an amount that could be easily concealed as they made their way to secret locations. In sharing that bit of bread and wine, they reminded themselves of the full meal Jesus shared with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. They remembered his broken body and shed blood, perhaps then with more understanding as their own bodies were being broken by the jaws of lions and their own blood shed for the emperor's pleasure. But the tiny bit of food also reminded them of better days in the past, when they met freely in homes around a dinner table, when rich and poor, and Jew and Gentile, men and women had their fill and broke together. That tiny bit of bread and wine passed furtively amongst themselves in secret, 
a full, satisfying meal. They get likely no wine. And those they came to share with and learn from in their after-dinner conversation about what it meant to be followers of Jesus were drunk to boot. What kind of conversation is that going to be? For the poor and enslaved among them, the weekly meal in the gathering of Jesus' followers might have been the only meal during the week when they could actually have enough to eat. But in the church of Jesus Christ in Corinth, which was supposed to emulate the meal where Jesus broke bread, even with the disciple who was going to betray him in a few hours, it had become every person for themselves. They didn't wait for everyone to arrive. They ate and drank the best, leaving only crumbs for the poor who came later. Paul is not the first bit concerned with whether those at dinner believed the bread and wine were actually or just symbolically the body and blood of Christ, or some weird combination of those things. Because that was not the point. The point was that Jesus, during his life, shared meals with everyone, with his faithful disciples, with Judas, with corrupt tax collectors, with the wealthy who wanted to learn more of his teaching, with society's outcasts, with learned scribes and Pharisees, with the Sadducees who were priests in the temple, with poor fishermen and those deemed unclean by the religious establishment. Jesus was berated for who he shared meals with perhaps more than anything else that he did. Who was allowed at your table said to the world, these are my people. And for Jesus, his people included everyone. His body was broken for everyone. His blood was shed for everyone. And once Jesus himself was gone, the central event that allowed everyone still to physically participate in Jesus' gracious and abundant welcome was the meal that Jesus told his followers to have whenever they gathered in remembrance of him. The meal that in Corinth was modeling now the exact opposite and had Paul scrambling to fix it. The founder of Methodism, an 18th century Anglican British priest named John Wesley, believed that the sacraments of the church, and especially the sacrament of Holy Communion, were what he called means of grace. That is, you didn't have to prove yourself worthy to receive the sacraments. It was precisely in the act of being welcomed by God, despite our quite obvious unworthiness, that we were able to understand the meaning of grace at all. Wesley believed that understanding, that the love and grace of God in Jesus is unconditional and available to all. That understanding was what caused any positive change in behavior, and not the other way around. You didn't have to prove yourself worthy enough to come to the table. You understood yourself to be worthy by being welcomed at the table with no strings attached. Because if Jesus welcomed you, who could possibly turn you away? And that realization is what changed lives. When we understand that do this in remembrance of me has nothing whatsoever to do with our own spiritual condition or what we believe about what we're eating, and everything about trying to emulate God's full welcome of every single person into our homes and at our tables. When we live that out, our fear of God is replaced with loving gratitude that is then free to flow out from us to any and all others. That outflow that meets the conditions of what Jesus names as the greatest commandment in all the Torah, to love God, and our neighbors as ourselves. I've always been drawn to the United Methodist practice of an open table at communion. Anyone is welcome because it's not about our own worthiness or being able to pass a theological exam about the nature of the elements. It is God's grace. God is the actor here, not us. 
in the American Baptist Church where I was raised, I couldn't take communion until after I was baptized, which in that tradition is typically around 12 years old. For the Baptists and many others, the people are the actors responding to God's command to do this. Communion and baptism in those denominations are called ordinances, not sacraments, because the people are ful fulfilling God's orders. God commands, do this, and so we do it. And therefore, you have to be old enough to understand what you're doing in order to participate. In Methodist churches, along with the Catholics, the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, and others who use the word sacrament, the implication is that God is the primary actor and not us. God said do this because God is able to bestow God's grace and love more easily through those actions. We don't come to give our duty, but to receive God's grace, a gift which we have not and cannot earn, and a gift we receive even if we can't read or understand a 40-page document. In our willingness to receive, we allow the sacrament to model God's extravagant love for all who participate and all who bear witness. And Wesley believed that experience of welcome was, every time, an opening for God to work in every person who participates. By participating in that, not by thinking about it, but by doing it, we begin to understand that we are loved. And when we truly understand we are loved, without condition and by God no less, hard hearts soften and the world, meal by meal, can become a better place. I think that symbolism of the communion table has been hugely diminished as we have come to believe that do this really meant think this. And that's why I refer to coffee hour after church as our full communion. In every church, in every tradition I've ever been a member of or visited, I found coffee hour to be a better example of the meal that Jesus instituted and that Paul was trying to fix in Corinth than any expression of the formal sacrament during worship, as most churches, including ours, celebrate it. But there is one place in today's world where communion is celebrated in the way I believe Jesus intended, all day, every day, and in every part of the world. The person presiding is a Spanish-American Catholic who found his way to true communion when he founded World Central Kitchen in 2010. Chef Jose Andres and World Central Kitchen were in the news this past week as seven of his eight workers were killed by an Israeli airstrike as they tried to feed the starving people of Gaza. In response, Chef Andres wrote a guest essay for the New York Times on April 3rd. I'm going to read you his entire essay because I believe in every way this is what the life of Jesus looks like in our day and time. From the prophetic call to justice to the compassion for the starving and that this is what Holy Communion should look like in every church that professes to follow Jesus. Not adding more times of getting more tiny little bits of bread and wine, but this. Chef Andres writes, In the worst conditions you can imagine, after hurricanes, earthquakes, bombs, and gunfire, the best of humanity shows up, not once or twice, but always. The seven people killed on a World Central Kitchen mission in Gaza on Monday were the best of humanity. They are not faceless or nameless. They are not generic aid workers or collateral damage in war. Saifuddin Nizam Maidad Abu Taha, John Chapman, Jacob Flickinger, Zoe Franco, James Henderson, James Kirby, and Damien Zoro 
risk everything for the most fundamentally human activity, to share our food with others. These are people I served alongside in Ukraine, Turkey, Morocco, the Bahamas, Indonesia, Mexico, Gaza, and Israel. They were far more than heroes. Their work was based on the simple belief that food is a universal human right. It is not conditional on being good or bad, rich or poor, left or right. We do not ask what religion you belong to. We just ask how many meals you need. From day one, we have fed Israelis as well as Palestinians. Across Israel, we have served more than 1.75 million hot meals. We've fed families displaced by Hezbollah rockets in the north. We have fed grieving families from the south. We delivered meals to the hospitals where the hostages were reunited with their families. We have called consistently, repeatedly, and passionately for the release of all the hostages. All the while, we have communicated extensively with Israeli military and civilian officials. At the same time, we have worked closely with community leaders in Gaza, as well as Arab nations in the region. There is no way to bring a ship full of food to Gaza without doing so. That's how we served more than 43 million meals in Gaza, preparing hot food in 68 community kitchens where Palestinians are feeding Palestinians. We know Israelis. Israelis in their heart of hearts know that food is not a weapon of war. Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. It is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinated their movements with the Israel Defense Forces. The Israeli government needs to open more land routes for food and medicine today. It needs to stop killing civilians and aid workers today. It needs to start the long journey to peace today. In the worst conditions after the worst terrorist attack in its history, it's time for the best of Israel to show up. You cannot save the hostages by bombing every building in Gaza. You cannot win this war by starving an entire population. We welcome the government's promise of an investigation into how and why members of our World Central Kitchen family were killed. That investigation needs to start at the top, not just the bottom. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said of the Israeli killings of our team, it happens in war. It was a direct attack on the clearly marked vehicles whose movements were known by the Israel Defense Forces. It was also the direct result of a policy that squeezed humanitarian aid to desperate levels. Our team was en route from a delivery of almost 400 tons of aid by sea. Our second shipment funded by the United Arab Emirates, supported by Cyprus, and with clearance from the Israel Defense Forces. The team members put their lives at risk precisely because this food aid is so rare and desperately needed. According to the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification Global Initiative, half the population of Gaza, 1.1 million people, faces the imminent risk of famine. The team would not have made the journey if there were enough food, traveling by truck across land to feed the people of Gaza. The people of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, regardless of ethnicity and religion, share a culture that values food as a powerful statement of humanity and hospitality, of our shared hope for a better tomorrow. There's a reason at this special time of year, Christians make Easter eggs. Muslims eat an egg at iftar dinners, and an egg sits on the Seder plate. The symbol of life and hope reborn springs extends across religions and cultures. I have been a stranger at Seder dinners. I have heard the ancient Passover stories about being a stranger in the land of Egypt. The commandment to remember, with a feast before you, that the children of Israel were once slaves. It is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. The people of Israel need to remember at this darkest hour what strength truly looks like.
Jesus Christ.